Ah, herzlich willkommen zum heutigen uh, MPIL Momentum. A very warm welcome to today's MPIL Momentum and apologies for the short delay. We are still trying to take hold of one of our panelists. I hope that uh, Jochen von Bernstorff will be able to, um, to, uh, to get in to, to this meeting. So we are trying to, to resolve any technical issues that might be, um, might be, uh, might be causing that problem. Um, I would like to start the, the session now. As usual, we are uh, also doing a recording. So if you are, um, if, if you are not okay with being re recorded here, we would kindly ask you to put off your camera um, and, and leave the, the meeting. Um, as to our, um, as to our processes in uh, conducting this discussion today, um, we will have first, uh, so much as to the choreography, we will first have um, a presentation by Sergio de la Valle uh, of his book for about 20 minutes. Then we have, will have presentations on the panel, comments by our distinguished panelists, and uh, a short exchange on the panel. And then we will have plenty of room and opportunity for a discussion among all of you of this very important and timely book. So it's my great pleasure to welcome today uh, Sergio de la Valle. We are very pleased and honored that he agreed to present his new book um, in this format here at the Max Planck Institute for Comparative Public Law and International Law. It is a book that evolved over almost two decades and um, it is linked in many ways also to the Institute where it originated. Paradigms of Social Order, which many of you might already have had a chance to glance over or look into more deeply, is a, um, a book that provides a systematic outline of the diverse theories on order as foundational principle of society, structuring them into different paradigms and highlighting also main differences. From a historical perspective, the book illustrates paradigmatic revolutions, as Sergio calls them in the book. And uh, he identifies these paradigmatic revolutions that might have had a profound impact on our thought on how societies ought to be ordered. Sergio closes with an assessment of the most promising strains of thought in his view in light of global challenges facing modern histories. I'm very pleased that we have today not only a presentation of this book, but we really have a constellation um, bringing together an intellectual uh, group or atmosphere that was very, um, very relevant at the Max Planck Institute in the first decade of the 2000s. And all the three panelists that we have here, as well as the author himself, were part of that intellectual um, constellation. And the book in itself also brings us back to many of the debates in the early um, years of the new millennium. You will, if you read it, encounter protagonists um, such not only as Habermas, but also Goldsmith and Posner, Jeremy Repkin, or others that are more justly or not meanwhile forgotten. But of course, you will also enter a uh, tour d'horizon of the main lines of political thought from Plato and Aristotle leading up to Hannah Arendt, Habermas, Luhmann, uh, and Michel Foucault. Sergio de la Valle, who is here with us today, almost needs no, disc no introduction here in this circle. He is a professor of public law and state theory at the University of Turin, and he has been affiliated with the Max Planck Institute for Comparative Public Law and International Law since 2003. It was during his work as a co-director of the Max Planck Research Project Paradigms of Public Order that he co-directed jointly with Armin von Bogdandi, that Sergio de la Valle began, began researching paradigms of order. And with the present publication, um, we have the outcome of nearly 20 years of his work on the topic. On the panel, we have, as I mentioned, also a group of scholars who have been involved in discourse on these topics at the Institute for many years. Jochen von Bernstorff, who hopefully will soon join us. Jochen holds the Chair for Constitutional Law, International Law and Human Rights at the University of Tübingen since 2011. He has taught international law as visiting professor in many places, including 
also the uh, program of the Federal Foreign Office, where he served as a diplomat from 2002 to 2007 um, before joining the Institute and completing his habilitation at Heidelberg. His main fields of research are general international law, theory and history of international law and its institutions. And currently he focuses among other things on the evolution of the prohibition of the use of force, but also on colonial and decolonial con continuities in international law. It is also my pleasure to introduce to you Matthias Goldmann, who is since December 1st, professor of international law at the EBS Law School in Wiesbaden and continues to be a senior research fellow at the Institute. From 2016 to 2021, he, holds the he held the position of a junior professor of international public law and financial law at Goethe University in Frankfurt. And he has been a member of the Institute since 2004. His main focus of research lies in the areas of legal approaches to globalization, in particular, the law of international organizations and international public authority and global administrative law, but also in transformation of the sources of international law, including, uh, including colonial and decolonial transformations and the law of public finance, sovereign debt and financial markets. And last but not least, it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce Dana Schmalz, who is currently a visiting professor teaching international law at the University of Jena. And since September 2020, again, a senior research fellow at MPIL, where she already completed her PhD from 2013 to 2017. Uh, the uh, PhD dissertation came out as a book last year, titled Refugees, Democracy and the Law, Political Rights, and at the margin of the state with Routledge. Dana is, among other things, the co-editor of Völkerrechtsblog, and her main research foci lie in the areas of, re of refugee law, migration, and citizenship, international and European human rights law, critical approaches to international law, legal philosophy, law, and literature. And as you might have noted already in these introductions, there are many connections, not only on the kind of biographical um, constellations um, level between the panelists and the author of the book and the main themes of the books, but also in on the level of the research fields of the respective participants uh, of this podium discussion today. But without further ado, I would now, Sergio, invite to present to us the key features of the book and also tell us a little bit about um, its uh, evolution, how it came about, the key questions at the beginning and the key questions how they evolved during the process of writing and thinking about these topics. Um, we are very pleased to have you here, Sergio, today, and you have the floor now. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And above all, I want to thank the Max Planck Institute for Comparative Public Law and International Law and in particular, the directors, Professor Anne Pogodani and Professor Anne Peters, as well as Alexandra and the excellent Berlin office for organizing this book presentation, and thus for giving me the opportunity to discuss some of the results of my research within the context of such a distinguished venue. Furthermore, I also want to thank Professor Jochen von Bernstein, Matthias Goldman, and Dana Schwarz for accepting to act as discussants. In my short opening contribution, to the discussion, I would like to point out some of the main contents of my book. Yet before I delve into this, I want to shortly recall that I was lucky enough to have my manuscript accepted by Parker Macmillan to be included into the series with the title Philosophy, Public Policy and Transnational Law, which gave me the possibility to roam freely between the disciplines of political and legal philosophy, political science and law. I can only encourage everyone who shares my interdisciplinary interest to follow my steps. But now let us focus on the, on the contents of the book. The first question that almost naturally comes out is, why did I decide to carry out a long and painstaking research on what I call the paradigms of social order? For a long time, together with my old friend Armin, and with other members of the scientific staff of the Max Planck Institute, and then to write down my personal view of the results in this book. The first reason for the endeavor was to attempt, or the attempt to lay down a map of the different theories about social order. To the advantage, at least I hope and believe, of both scholars and students. 
Indeed, we have quite a lot of theories of social order, but we lack in particular in the last decades, a broadly conceived effort to work out the strengths of thought that brought to them. In other words, what are their similarities and what are their specific differences to look at? If put in a figurative form, we could say that caught in the midst of many trees, we lost maybe the sight of the whole forest. However, such an idea is quite a tricky one. Indeed, I was confronted on a daily basis with my own limits. Firstly, the research is almost exclusively focused on Western theories of thought. This happened, obviously, not because I believe that nothing interesting can be found elsewhere, but simply for the most trivial reason, because, namely because of a lack of confidence. In fact, it would be one of my foremost wishes that scholars from non-Western traditions complete the picture and maybe contest the results. Secondly, synthesis has always its down, its own downsides. Specialists of almost all authors I included into the research can probably argue that important details have been used. In fact, it may be surprising that, for example, Hobbes is interpreted as the antecessor of liberal and democratic thinking, that the theory of the constitutionalization of international law is linked to medieval Christian thinking, that Hegel and Marx are paving the way to Appel and Habermas, which probably Appel and Habermas themselves would contest. Surely the synthesis I propose is not carved in stone. Rather, I believe that it should be seen as an invitation to the scientific community to take up the challenge and possibly do better. And last remark on this point, the attempt to lay down a synthetic ac account of a field of knowledge runs against the predominant tendency of the present research in humanities, which is generally concentrated on differences and not on systemic similarities. Synthesis is generally left to the so-called hard sciences. Yet I believe that this is a serious mistake. Synthesis must be for the orientation of young and old and for underlying that we never build our society on the basis of the analysis of details in which we go easily lost, but because we have an idea of society. Once accepted this syn that synthesis must be and that we should not refrain from risky endeavors, the question arises on which conceptual instruments should be used for the purpose. I opted for the notion of the paradigms of social order, which now needs to be shortly explained. At first, this is evidently a composed concept, which is made up of two different notions, order, that means social, since, since we are talking here of the order created in social interactions and paradigm. Let us start by explaining why I choose the first. The advantage of using order and not, for example, state, essentially lies in its broad semantic range and flexibility. In fact, by order, we understand every system of rules that makes social interactions peaceful, predictable, and to a certain extent, even corporate. Understood this way, the Greek polis were a form of order no less than the modern state. And so where, among others, the medieval communitas Christiana, the nation, hunting towns, civilizations, or the community of humankind. Moving on now to the second concept implied within the title of the book, namely to the notion of paradigm, it must be anticipated that this concept is often used, but seldom clarified. Let us briefly contend for the sake of this conversation that I regard a paradigm as a set of fundamental concepts that, that shape our theoretical understanding of the world or, or part of it and our practical approach to it, which means our way to properly act within the given, given context with reference to a certain matter and in a certain period of time. As a result, every field of human knowledge and practice has its own paradigm that change over time, but are always specific to that discipline. Although a certain overlapping of the paradigms of different disciplines is not to rule out, since their establishment and elaboration always follow the general development of knowledge. Thus we have the paradigms of biology and those of physics, the paradigms of psychology and those of chemistry and so on. And according to the same principle, 
we also have the specific paradigms that define the forms of social order. Put this way, the paradigms of social order are those sets of fundamental concepts that lay down the basis for different visions of what social order is and should be. In this definition, I said it should be, is obviously implied that these paradigms are at the same time descriptive and prescriptive. To make things a little bit clearer, it may be useful to specify that, for instance, the medieval idea of social order in the Western world was determined by the concepts that defined the communitas Christiana, while its modern counterpart was shaped by the essential features of the notion of the individual. And the idea of social order in the 19th century was largely defined by the contents of the concept of nation. As I already said before, paradigms change over time. This happens where their conceptual framework cannot explain any longer what happens in the world or the evidence then that we can gather on it. New discoveries about the world as regards natural sciences or new social developments with reference to social sciences put a strain on the then dominant paradigm up to the point of origin. At the beginning, the defenders of the establishment of established system of thinking make any possible effort to insert the new elements into the old frame. But in the end, this endeavor proves to be more costly than searching for new solutions. It is at this point that the brightest minds of their time develop the set of concepts for a new theoretical and practical understanding of the world. That means a new paradigm. This is what we can call a paradigmatic revolution, the dawn of a new era for knowledge and action. Paradigmatic revolutions happen in all disciplines. Nevertheless, there is a significant difference between the paradigms of natural sciences and those of social sciences. While the first appear and disappear one after the other, so that they rarely coexist beside one another, the paradigms of social sciences and therefore also those of social order never die after having been successfully established. As a result, paradigms of social order that shaped the way in which our ancestors understood the well ordered society many hundreds of years ago are still a considerable part of any contemporary debate. But now, beyond the methodological questions, it's time to concentrate on the main content of the book, namely on which features make up a paradigm of social order. That is, on which features distinguish a paradigm of social order. For, from any other paradigm of any other discipline. A paradigm or a set of fundamental concepts that guide our theoretical and practical use of reason can be recognized as a paradigm of social order in as much as it contains claims about three essential questions. Firstly, the extension of order. Secondly, its ontological basis. And thirdly, the question of whether order must necessarily be unitary or can also be pluralistic. The first claim addresses the issue on whether order is inevitably limited to a homogeneous social community or can potentially be extended to the whole humankind. The claim related, the second claim related to the ontological foundation of order then is centered on whether some kind of organic community, the whole order, whole, builds the basis of social order or rather the individuals are at the center of society. The third claim finally is about whether a well-ordered society has to be necessarily unitary and hierarchical with no overlapping of horizontal and horizontal interaction of norms and institutions or a plural society with a, a hierarchical normative and institutional system can also be seen as well-ordered. On the basis of this conceptual organ, the book moves on to present the different paradigms of order one by one, starting with the oldest one and ending by the most recent. Each paradigm is described from the moment of its creation up to the present. As I already said, no established paradigm of order never became extinct. And it is presented through a brief analysis of its most relevant exponents, who mark the stage of its development. The readers might find surprising and I hope also somehow intriguing that I inserted at the beginning of each chapter and at the very end of the book references to materials 
which have nothing to do with political, legal philosophy and science, but are drawn mostly from literature, but also from films and music. I made these additions not only to make the reading of the book less heavy, although I have to acknowledge that elaborating on this part was probably mo the most fun to me, but also to make clear that the paradigms of social order generally refer to a null encompassing view of the world, which impact not just on the theories of order, but also on other parts of our knowledge in general. Considering the sequence of the paradigms of order presented in the book, the analysis starts with the most ancient of all, based on the idea that order, order is only possible within limited and homogeneous communities. Whereas between these social, political, and legal communities, only containment of this order is feasible. Beyond being therefore particularistic, order is, according to this first paradigm, also necessarily holistic since it must be grounded on the assumption that the whole of the community has more value than the single individual, or even more than the sum of all individuals that constitute the community. The development of the paradigm is presented from the political thought of ancient Greece until contemporary neoconservatives, passing through past and new nationalism, as well as through the theories of state sovereignty, of the clash of civilizations and the rational choice-based criticism of international law. The first paradigmatic revolution, which led to the second paradigm of order, impacted on the assumption contained in every paradigm of order, as I said before, regarding the extension of the will of the society. In particular, the second paradigm of order is characterized by the assumption that the well-ordered society potentially includes the whole human family. Like in the holistic particularistic paradigm, however, it is maintained that the community on which the whole is founded is endowed with a higher value as a whole than the individuals of whom it is composed. Except that in this case, the community has a cosmopolitan scope, not a limited one, but it's cosmopolitan scope. First introduced by the Stoic philosopher, but probably anticipated in the non-Western, the non-Western world by, by Buddhism. Uh, the idea of a community of humankind and thus the holistic universalistic paradigm of order did not become a powerful historical force, at least in the Western world, until Christian thinkers made it to one of the essential tenets of their vision of the world. The chapter anal an analyzes um, achievements and shortcomings of the Christian Catholic understanding of universalism, whose deficit essentially derives from the assumption that cosmopolitanism can be based on religion as well as of its rationalistic counterpart, which questionably assumes on its side, the existence of a quintessential human sociability. The second paradigmatic revolution affected then the ontological basis of the well of the society. In contrast to the former patterns, the new paradigm, the paradigm of the modern world, founded order on the centrality of the individuals whereas public power was only justified to preserve their rights and interests. Once the individualistic turn in Western thought was introduced by the hugely innovative contractualist theory of state developed by Hawks and then by Locke and Rousseau, it was Kant, however, and then Kelsen, who made the universalistic attitude of this individualistic paradigm of order explicit. So, laying down the most impressive and ambitious visions of an all-inclusive order, Kant's and even more Kelsen's universalistic individualism was nevertheless affected by a substantial deficit. Since Soda could only be conceived in the most radical form as unitary, coherent hierarchy, pluralism was necessarily rejected as sheer disorder. Therefore, to cope with the present increase in social, institutional, and legal diversity, a new paradigmatic revolution was needed. The third paradigmatic revolution has recently overcome the idea that the well-ordered society must necessarily be tantamount to a system of unitary and hierarchically organized institutions and norms. As a result, the way it has been paved for order to be conceived as made of horizontal and partially overlapping political and legal structures. Three new paradigms of order have taken up the challenge. Systems theory, postmodernism, and the communicative paradigm. 
The final chapter of the book is dedicated to the communicative power and is the third most unitary pattern of the book. Its understanding of social order leads to a complex and multi-layered vision in which the clearly expressed preference for democratic legitimacy at any level of governance is reconciled with the necessity of global inclusion. And this reconciliation is uh, quite difficult issue. Furthermore, the recognition of diversity as a value shared with the other post unitarian understandings is certainly much better than in postmodernist or in systems theory to the high normative standards that characterize the most distinguished achievements of Western modern individuals. The sequence of the paradigms of all of us ends up being characterized by three main transitions corresponding to the three paradigmatic revolutions. First, from particularism to universalism, then from polis to individuals, and finally, from the unitary and hierarchical idea of order to pluralism. The question may justifiably arise here on whether this sequence only reflects a historical development or also entails a normative content. Well, on this point, I do not want to hide too easily behind some kind of factual argument. So that at the end of this short presentation, I have to candidly recognize that I'm convinced indeed that the challenges of our time can only be properly met by an idea of social order that is universalistic, which means capable of including the whole humankind, individualistic in the sense that individual rights are put at the center at, and pluralistic, so that different legal and institutional systems positively interact with one another under the dome of a shared rationality of communication. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sergio, for this introduction to the architecture and the narrative, but also the key argument, which is in the end a very, very strong and outspoken um, argument um, that is made. And I'm now, I would now would like to invite our panelists to comment on sections on the book and on this presentation. And um, I would like to invite Jochen von Bernstorff to make the start. Uh, thank you, Alexandra. Um, thank you, uh, Sergio, for your presentation. Um, I have the pleasure to, to comment on, on the book. Uh, Sergio de la Valle's paradigms, um, as I would like to call them, uh, attempt to develop a meta theory of social order, which in a way seems to be an, an impossible task. Impossible because of a lack of an objective hypothetical viewpoint from which to describe more than 2000 years of Western intellectually intellectual history related to perceptions of order and law from Thucydides to Hillary Charlesworth, because that's actually uh, the task. Um, Sergio de la Valle never claims to be in, in possession of an objective standpoint, removing himself from the object of study, but instead offers a set of intellectual paradigms which appear at a certain moment in history in the work of a philosopher, historian, or jurist, constituting, quote, paradigmatic revolutions. These paradigms reappear time and again in new guises and alterations in new historical contexts. For me, this book is a groundbreaking one for two reasons. The first reason is that the paradigms allow us to better understand recurring, if not eternal, features of theoretical constructions of order as well as their differences. The book thus provides us with fresh insights into intellectual path dependencies regarding conceptions of order and their theoretical innovations over time. The second reason why, in my view, this is a groundbreaking achievement is that the book succeeds in explaining the basic features of the various theoretical constructs in their changing political and historical context. We do learn why and for what purpose theorists at a certain moment in time um, developed 
their new approaches to order and law. Everybody who has attempted uh, to depict highly abstract theoretical concepts in their respective historical and political context knows how difficult it is to produce a readable text that does justice to both the theories and also uh, the context. Sergio de la Valle does not only succeed in doing this in a very elegant prose, but at the same time, the context, and, and I think this is always the danger, does not bury the guiding meta-theoretical analysis into much too much historical detail. In other words, it is a highly accessible book with numerous new insights into scholarly reflections on order, law, and society over the course of the centuries. The second reason is that Sergio de la Valle has a truly interdisciplinary perspective on the theoretical and historical uh, material, which I think is uh, unique. It is uh, the book through a unique blend of perspectives manages to integrate not only a philosophical and international legal perspective, but also economic and sociological theories once they become important in constructing new or modifying old paradigms of order. As if this were not enough, Serge Lavalla adds reflections on Dante, Josef Roth, Milan Kundera, Fritz Lang, and Pink Floyd, to name only a few of the literary or artistic works discussed in the book. Far from being la pour la, these reflections also help to contextualize theoretical sensibilities at the heart of the paradigms. And reading these parts of the book, we are extremely happy that Sergio de la Valle did not try to remove himself from the object of study, but engages in uh, a very personal interpretation of these works. The book is a great achievement. And like with every important scholarly work, you get the feeling that it fills a lacuna, that it had to be written in a way and had been waiting for a scholar up to the task. Now I have three uh, questions, reflections, or reactions uh, inspired by reading the book. The first one is a reformulation of the hen and egg problem. What exactly is the relationship between these paradigms and the world around them? Are they produced by the material world around the authors or are they themselves creating this world? Sergio speaks of paradigmatic revolutions. And the question for me is whether these revolutions really follow um, a scholarly logic of innovative knowledge production or whether they are just, uh, you may call them zeitgeist phenomena in the sense of scholarly ex post affirmations of existing power relations, of existing forms of order out there. <clears throat> or in other words, are the paradigmatic revolutions perhaps cementing certain forms of order over long historical periods rather than being scholarly endeavors driven by an, um, by an perhaps eternal scholarly search for truth? That's my first question. The second question relates to the role of the paradigms in a broader international law discourse. Let's take international legal debates in the late 19th century uh, European uh, imperial period as an example. My hunch would be that more than one paradigm can be observed in international discourse in that time uh, in the discourse justifying uh, the colonial conquests. Uh, we are in a phase of hypernationalism, end of 19th century, which is, of course, uh, an expression of the holistic particularism paradigm in Sergio's uh, words. At the same time, the civilizing mission works with natural law assumptions regarding a common humanity to which also the so-called, quote, non-civilized or, quote, savages uh, are supposed to belong, according to contemporary scholars of the time. 
In fact, the assumption that they are part of a universal natural law, the colonized, uh, often justifies the paternalistic colonial interventions of the Europeans uh, in the sense of Kipling's white man's burden. Colonial discourse thus is shaped by holistic particularism and holistic universalism, the two paradigms uh, of the three of the book, uh, as well as racism, of course, at the same time. So you find elements of both paradigms jointed in international legal discourse. So my question is, second question, whether or not um, the simultaneity of these various paradigms in international legal discourse can actually be theoretically explained by the approach taken in the book. My third point, unsurprisingly perhaps, is Sergio de la Valle's take on Kelsen. I agree with Sergio on putting Kelsen in the universalistic individualism category, even though his individualism is very different from the more substantive moral individualism of Kant, uh, as the book carves out, I think, diligently. It's not a right-based individualism in, in Kelsen's case. In my view, Kelsen's concept of the empty universal form, which can take on every content and be imposed vertically on the various community communities populating the world through regional and global institutions should be read, first of all, as a critique, as a critique of two contemporary convictions of ruling European elites, namely a critique of a secularized and homogeneous notion of the sovereign nation state as the be all and end all of political and legal imagination. And secondly, as a critique of the, of the pervasive conviction that issues of war and peace, as well as other issues of high politics, cannot be effectively regulated by law-based global institutions. The book seems to acknowledge the critical potential of Kelsen's works, but criticizes the hierarchical construction, uh, which allegedly does not allow for notions of legal pluralism. Indeed, Kelsen insists on unity for epistemological reasons, even though his monist legal universe does not exclude the existence of state legal orders as such. Kelsen is completely agnostic as to the concrete level of centralization of this monist legal system. That's a question of the content of the international legal order, which changes over time and is contingent. But indeed, the hierarchical system developed by Kelsen's monist construction seems somewhat out of date, given early 21st century complex multi-level governance structures, including regimes of various degrees of legal formality. But even there, I would say the critical potential of Kelsenian concepts remains an important scholarly contribution. The current plurality of legal regimes without clear hierarchies and contested validity is in the interest of the strongest political, military, and economic actors. Not having the military, uh, it, no, no, the strongest economic actors and stabilizes an unequal and ultimately hegemonic status quo. And as regards the use of force, for instance, a more hierarchical rule of law-based system of collective security and disarmament would be in the interest of weaker actors, I would claim, not having the military capabilities to defend themselves against aggression from outside. Or take the climate crisis. Strong global institutions, including a strong notion of the primacy of international law, would be extremely helpful in enforcing not only reduction targets, but global mitigation and adaption measures, which will involve significant redistributive measures on the global level. And these measures would have to be administered by a strong international law. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jochen. I would like to hand over immediately to Matthias Goldmann. Thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure to read this book. 
Sergio has been a friend for many years and uh, I owe him a lot. I owe him many insights um, during my PhD time. It was always a rich source of inspiration and of orientation. And um, in my talk, which has three points, that would also be my third, my first point. What do I think is the value of this book? I think the primary principle and lasting value for which the reason for which I would recommend everyone to read this book is the absolute, besides the absolute stupendous knowledge of the author that you really can, that soaks from the pages is really the the, the uh, impressive orientation that it provides in a host of theories that can be extremely confusing. There is a prequel to this book, a paper that you find on the internet. And I must say that for three years or so, I think I have um, always given that paper to my students in Frankfurt in the legal theory course, although they're very knowledgeable about theory, all of them have found that book very useful. Um, and it also contains the four paradigms and spells them out in a very com condensed form. And it, it, simply because it tells you what is at stake with all these different theories and why certain people say what they say. It makes sense. Many things, many, many, uh, li much literature and many utterances that you can, uh, that you can hear all of a sudden make sense. And it is also commendable that this orientation or it's a factor for the success of this paper in my class and hopefully for the success of this book that it really breaks down a complex theoretical landscape into four boxes. Uh, four boxes which don't come at the expense of further differentiation. So I think within these boxes, we see a lot of nuance. And I suppose that on that basis, you're really competent to give a different reading to concrete legal disputes uh, and legal and practical issues that we have in this world, for example, the disputes between the European Court of Justice and several national apex courts like the Bundesverfassungsgericht or the Polish Constitutional Tribunal. Um, at, uh, what is really at stake in all of these disputes is beyond the mere doctrinal level, a different or a difference in the understandings of order. What do you think is a legitimate form of organizing society? And if you don't reach to that level as a scholar, you're really missing big in all these disputes. So I think it's essential knowledge for anyone who wants to work on a comparative constitutional law nowadays, or for anyone who wants to work on international organizations. We see a reorientation in international organizations. New, problem produce, new problems produce new organizations, for example, in the fields of climate change, in the fields of migration or taxation. We've got yeah, new forms of organization, which, of course, vary what has already been there. But um, uh, I suppose that um, predicting whether they will be successful or even giving advice would, would, would be a useful form of organization for a specific problem requires some knowledge of these paradigms of order. You have to understand the deeper structure of how the world works and how um, cooperation and social integration is ultimately possible. So. That is why I think this book is extremely important, both actually for theorists and for students of political theory or international law, and even for practitioners, or at least, you know, students of international law will have to translate the ideas in this book to practitioners and ultimately feed that into um, very practical problems. That might not be the purpose of the book, but I think it has a, a really great value here. That was my first point. Now I've got two points where um, I respectfully uh, would like to, um, uh, come up with some critical remarks. The first concerns the use Sergio makes of the instrument of paradigms or of the concept of paradigms. Now, Sergio uses paradigms in a cross historical sense. He traces paradigms as they walk throughout history or as theorists have adapted them over and over again to new contexts. An alternative would be to see history as a sequence of paradigms in the sense of struggles, yeah? That you don't see one, a paradigm as a theoretical line that runs through history, but that you go, so to say, horizontally, that you cut across history and that you see one historical period as the struggle of two or three or several paradigms. And now there are advantages to both of these um, um, uh, approaches. I think the approach chosen by Sergio has the big advantage that it provides greater orientation. We see how some topics, some 
tropes, as you might say, or some, um, you know, some some images, some um, um, forms of thinking come up over and over again and get varied. Yeah, and how they get adapted says a lot about that time already. So I think it has the uh, the advantage of orientation. The second advantage of Cedrus um, way of proceeding is attack. You can much better show the flaws of one paradigm, like for example, holistic particularism, if you show that it has failed consistently to meet even its own expectations. Yeah, and that is what Sergio does greatly. And you see, he's not a friend of um, a particularistic holism. Um, and uh, I think that also has some value that you're describing the history of theory, not only from an observer standpoint, but that you're also a participant in that discourse, especially in the last chapter eight, but also throughout history, you're always taking your standpoint. And I think certain propositions, you can really show their loopholes and, and, and their gaps and how they, how they come, uh, come again and then again, uh, reappear again and again at different periods of time. So that is a very powerful uh, destruction that you make of some of these paradigms. Yet there are some downsides to your way of structuring it. And there are some advantages to a more horizontal um, uh, you know, more periodic way of progressing throughout history. Um, first of all, the first of, is almost uh, the first part of critique is almost trivial. And at some points, I thought that you felt obliged to, to fill in a loop, a gap in a certain paradigm, and you're coming up with theorists who might have played a role, but who might not have played that big a role after all. So you're you're reviving, for example, the ideas of Las Casas, who is definitely an important theorist, but we cannot say to what extent Las Casas really influenced Grotius and to what extent this is not an, an exposed um, construction. So the question is really what, what value has there been to these theories? Or Adam Müller, I was greatly en enthused by knowing more about Adam Müller and his romanticized idea of, um, of, of the nation, but I'm not so sure to what extent it really has influence the course of things. And I'm saying this from a very practical perspective of an international lawyer. The second point of critique is that at some points, I think the um, only at a few points, the, the desire to pack theories into certain boxes that fit the four pattern, the pattern of four uh, boxes might go a little bit too far. That concerns especially the postmodernist paradigm in uh, one few later in um, chapter, sorry, in chapter seven, um, you say that postmodernism is a bit like Pink Floyd, cut you into pieces. Yeah, it cuts things into pieces. I think you're taking it a little bit too far. You're cutting um, uh, certain approaches or the context of the approaches that you're discussing a little bit into pieces. I say that also because it concerns my own work. Now you're placing neoliberal approaches to global governance postmodern critics and IPA, uh, International Public Authority, this um, renewed approach to international organization in that box of postmodern approaches, what gets lost here a little bit is how they react to each other and thereby also what distinguishes them. So on the one hand, uh, neoliberal global governance, I don't know even if it's postmodern, if it's fair to call it postmodern, it's certainly post-unitary, the individual is certainly at the center, but that's that's um, a, you know characteristic of modern theories. That's not really uh, what makes it postmodern. Postmodern critics react fundamentally and 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 first and foremost to these neoliberal approaches. Ne neoliberal thought approaches. I'm talking uh, in particularly about particularly about Anne Marie Slaughter and Andrew Morawczyk, and um, they are so to say the principal enemy for some postmodern Chris critics like Koskeniemi. And what Ipa and Gaul does is actually also a critique of neoliberal global governance, but probably from an emancipatory standpoint, uh, one that takes or tries at least to take um, um, rights and human rights and legal structures more and, and legal procedures more seriously. In that respect, it really greatly overlaps with global constitutionalism, which conspicuously is not in this category of postmodernist approaches that would probably stretch things a bit too far to consider uh, constitutionalist approaches as postmodern, but I think they at least belong in the same category as international public authority. Why is that so? Because I suppose 
there is a huge difference between Alfred Ferdros's idea of the constitution of international law, which you categorize, and I think rightly so, in the box of holistic universalism. Ferdros thinks that the world is you know, a community and that community has a legal order. And that allowed him to presuppose that international law is a gapless system in the 1920s in opposition to theorists like Trippel, who claimed that international law only goes as far as sovereign states have decided that it should go. Yeah. So international law is a system that exists, you know, somehow independently of states, even though states are the main, uh, uh, the main um, actors. And that, I think, is really to be, to be distinguished from the debate about global constitutionalism that we have had since the 1990s, where individual rights and not community are the central notion. If you go through the literature on global uh, constitutionalism, you will see that it is, it, it is mostly about human rights. I've done so because I've been looking specifically at where global constitutionalists mention democracy. And you will find very little. You find some pieces, for example, in the work of Samantha Besson, if you want to categorize I want to categorize her as a global constitutionalist, but uh, on the whole, most global constitutionalists, those who identify as such, are um, uh, talking about human rights, and uh, that um, makes them, um, you know, that brings them um, um, very close in connection with um, uh, with the IPA. Anyway, and and it shows just the difference which there is between them and Weltros. And I think if you want to have a um, a theoretical forerunner of that kind of constitutionalism, then I would recommend uh, not Ferdros, but Hermann Heller. I've got here a copy. Um, uh, Hermann Heller dedicated it to Victor Bruns. Uh, this is what you find in the treasure uh, uh, trove of the Max Planck Institute with its original uh, copies. And this is really a, a, a great book, Hermann Heller's book on sovereignty of 1927, um, in which he, I think, um, for the first time, um, develops a theory of constitutional pluralism that um, probably we see in a different form in the 1990s. Anyway, so much on uh, that category. Uh, the last uh, point I have on um, on your use of paradigms, I think there is a certain risk also. If you trace paradigms throughout history, that at some points you lose context. You do so it, 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 that doesn't happen very often because on the whole, the book is very, very contextual. You're always introducing, you know, the paradigmatic revolutions, how that came from uh, many, many contextual sources. But I thought, when, for example, when you present Adam Müller um, and um, how he shifts the particul particular holism to a culturalistic slash biological understanding, you're probably painting it a little bit into rosy terms as a new approach to particular holism and you know as a revival of theories that had been uh, of of hops etc and uh, of, of theories that uh, that had seen uh, their better days um, instead of seeing it as a reaction of western thought to a imperialistic context within which biology got a new meaning a meaning that came out of a context of racism as it was experienced in the colonial context and, and this ambiguity between racism and culturalistic notions of um, you know forming a group is also very characteristic of other notions that we uh, see in that context like the concept of civilization so i think the concept of nation seen from that perspective the concept of nation which stands in the center of muller's work has a lot to do with the concept of civilization and if we look at that from a you know from a broader contextual perspective and don't see it so much as a theoretical um, as, as a certain stage in the theoretical evolution, but rather as a contextual revolution, as something that reacts to a certain challenge. How do I justify European superiority in a colonial context? Then we might get a different um, perspective on it um, than the one you have. Now, that was my second point. My last point is very short. That concerns the current context. What is our perspective for the future? What you propose is a communicative um, paradigm and how does that translate into international institutions? Um, <clears throat> you're um, suggesting that international institutions should enable communicative processes that are, so to say, power free or free of illegit. Uh, there are ways to channel power into into le legitimate purposes, and um, that includes international organizations, which should ideally take the form of a parliament, and it, con it includes um, democratic nation states. And it includes 
chords which enter into a dialogue. Now, if I want to give a song to that, it would probably be the Beatles. Imagine there's no heaven. Yeah, everyone comes together and everyone talks, and then what you know what comes out is a very peaceful life. Now, unfortunately, the last decade has shown us, or probably the last two decades, probably it began all it all began with uh, September 11. They've shown us that the world is not such a peaceful place, and that this coming together um, through communicative processes um, is theoretically still beautiful, but practically insufficient as a way of organizing the world. And I think that tendency has even increased in recent years where we see global shifts or geopolitical shifts, if you want to say so, we see a rising China, which poses itself as a different actor, a very different actor. We just had this conference on democracy organized by President Biden, where China was not invited. China then reacted with its own um, concept of democracy, where they claim that term and give it a particular meaning that is not in line with you know, Western uh, concepts of free elections and uh, free speech. And uh, that means we're in a much more conflictuous era right now, maybe an era that we could describe by uh, songs of uh, Kurt Weil, uh, uh, Mackie Messer, uh, Mac the Knife, or um, to take a uh, uh, current contemporary song, Billy Eilish, Bad Guy. If you don't know that, you should watch it on YouTube. That's what the teenager watched. Um, so I think those are songs that better describe where we are right now and what forms of organization that would amount to. I still think that communication has great value in organizing global peace, but I think that this will happen much more in circumscribed, specific, global, uh, or specific, limited international organizations, which share certain convictions, which are believed to be essential for the issue area on which they focus. So you will have, for example, um, um, uh, regional organizations on human rights. That would be one example where the, human, the conviction that human rights should be upheld is really strong. And each state that doesn't agree at some point probably has to leave that organization that concerns the rule of law. We see already how that is happening in the EU, how states that um, don't respect the rule of law have no place in it. That might also concern even climate change where states that don't want to decarbonize quickly enough um, might have to leave groups of states which want to have a stronger cooperation that move uh, more quickly to, su to a sustainable, sustainable future because they think that there's just no other uh, perspective. And then those states in the in-group, so to say, could respond with, uh, with um, uh, trade sanctions and so for those uh, against those who don't want to participate. I don't think that we're, to end up with this, um, uh, with this comment, I don't think that we're going to move into a new Cold War situation because the Cold War, um, in the Cold War, you had two neatly circumscribed blocks. I think that the blocks are much more issue specific in the world in which we are now. There are certain topics on which you can easily cooperate, even with um, you know, those who reject Western notions of democracy. Um, but there are other topics where you don't want to cooperate with them. So it's really issue specific and there's a lot more conflict. And um, again, here, I'll, I'll send the link to uh, the song that you all should um, uh, sing uh, and, and or uh, uh, that maybe might illustrate the time which we're in. But of course, that doesn't take away any of the value of this book, because as always, as scholars, we are condemned um, to the fate of Minerva's all. We'll only see the present situation much clearer in 10 years or so. And um, for a description of everything that's happened, that has happened until now, I can only recommend Sergio's book. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. The high fashat scene, the moderator will also show her show her tease now, but I didn't want to um, to to insist on time too much because uh, I think the two statements that we have heard already show one of the great qualities of this book as a kind of uh, piece of orientation. It really opens avenues. It stimulates you and intrigues you to uh, to go to the library, to go to YouTube, and to follow up and also check. The, uh, the paradigms that Sergio de la Valle um, develops in this book against your own uh, work and your own theoretical um, presumptions. And um, I'm now curious to hear what Dana Schmalz has taken from her reading of Sergio de la Valle's book. Um, I would like to uh, suggest that we 
uh, take another 15 minutes after the, uh, the panelists presentation to give room also for the discussion in the room and that we uh, that we take time until um, quarter to five for the plenary discussion if that's if that's convenient for you Sergio as well okay then uh, Dana you have the floor now all right thank you very much um, I'll try to be concise and thank you for the opportunity of sharing my thoughts here on the panel and for the opportunity of engaging with this interesting book really I did enjoy it very much. I also agree with what Jochen von Bernstorff has said that all those references to the literature, the arts are really not marginal at all, that they are very central to what this book does, really situating uh, normative thought within this wider intellectual histories. And I, this was enjoyable and it was also really insightful for me. And I find those large theories as this is one um, fantastic because they enable everybody to um, kind of uh, to oppose something to situate within those paradigms. So I think they are really helpful in structuring conversations. And Alexandra said this beautifully in the beginning, how present the thought of this book or of what became this book has been at the Institute. And I can only agree that when I did arrive at the Institute, this was very present. So when reading the book, I kind of found how some of this seemed so natural to me. And I guess it's also natural because it was part of my academic growing up. So this said, I hope I can add a little bit to the many considerations that are now already on the table. I want to make three points that are a bit kind of a broader question of the met methodological self-understanding or kind of the, the above, <laughs> the beyond, um, then one really insight, the analysis, picking out some aspects, especially in the um, more current parts. And then I also want to br uh, briefly connect it with some of my, well, I mostly think about migration and I found this an interesting lens of also thinking about those paradigms. So starting with the, um, brought with the above. The book begins with this general history of thought and thinking about order as essence of the world, Sergio cites his yacht and Ovid. And it made me think that we could also go back to the story of creation and this really creation being understood as a separation, as a making of order, of a separation of light and day, uh, of light and darkness, a separation of land and water. And I, I mention this because I think it's an interesting prompt for two things. Firstly, it's an interesting prompt for the connection between thought and reality. So, I mean, in the story of creation, it's this um, uh, saying, the thought that creates everything. But in our existence as observing scholars, but also situated in the world we live through, we have this constant challenge, maybe the core challenge also of critical theory, that we are of service while we are also part, and that there's so much endeavor in trying to understand how, how do we count in our own situatedness. So the book does this beautifully, and Serge also in the introduction now mentions this understanding of paradigms as both descriptive and prescriptive. Now I want to connect it with a question, because really viewing us as situated also in the analysis, I think it means that those historical lines we can identify will change depending on where we stand in the history. So my question to you is, do you think that 50 years ago or 50 years from now, those paradigms in, for looking at intellectual history would be the same or would be different? So I'm trying to think a little bit of what is the self-understanding of how removed from historical uh, situatedness this perspective is. Now the second prompt from the story of creation is the um, it's kind of the purpose. So I mean we always find there this and it was good. And I think this is true for order in every sense that we always have an order for some purpose or it's a good order for some purpose. And I think that's a real challenge for such a meta theory of social order because not only the paradigms are both prescriptive and descriptive. I think even a meta theory of social order cannot really avoid the question for what. 
So this is the second point I want to make that I've been reading through the book, wondering a little bit what, how normative this meta theory is. Now with this, I'll, I'll come a little bit to the analysis of the book and I really, because also time has progressed already, I want to jump to some part in the really last phase and I, I think one interesting point, I think this is mentioned by Matthias, also Jochen von Bernstoff already, that I think this is a book that acknowledges its particular Western uh, history viewpoint. But something happens, of course, in 20th century, and especially uh, at the moment we are now, because the conversation into which those lines of thinking enter cannot avoid, um, well, there is a conversation now with other traditions of thought. And I found this to be, um, so, so there is something where even accepting that one takes one um, line of thought, one has to see those thoughts confronted a little bit with different understandings of even the history. So I, I was wondering what this what role this really plays when thinking about um, plurality in this phase. And I, I just, I felt that especially the uh, the part which were titled Orders as Oppression, I think 7.2, they, they listed um, trail, they listed feminist critiques. And in my understanding, this is not so much um, a challenge against the concept of order as such, but a challenge against a specific order and a call for another order. So something that also raised the question of dynamic in order. So um, something I'll come back to when I talk about migration in a moment. Now, I, I very much agreed with the reading of Arendt. I wanted to mention just because there was a minor thing I was missing in the book that there's been fantastic work by Christian Falk on understanding Hannah Arendt precisely as a thinker of order and also as a thinker of order because she experienced the world as lacking order. So thinking from the margins and really valuing this, um, this role of institutions despite their um, necessary shortcomings. So just to say that I think there is a lot of ambivalence in those um, handling of a dynamic and uh, the value of institutions. Now, the, what I most was missing in this analysis of more recent thought history was a turn that maybe could be titled post post modernity. So post modern is pretty old by now. And I think, so I was thinking of in 2018, there was the conference in Berlin called Emancipation, organized by Rahel Yagi and others, so really bringing together political philosophers. And it was called Emancipation, but many then said, is emancipation even still the notion we want to kind of um, engage with? Is, is haven't we moved towards thinking much more about shared vulnerability, mutual responsibility, dependence on each other. And this is a line of thought, and I think it goes to the core of what you're discussing because it concerns the basics of human coexistence, of what are the normative basics of human coexistence. And I think this turn away from freedom as the ultimate guiding star, as the ultimate orientation point towards something that is more oriented at the interdependencies on um, ethics, on responsibility. To me, this is a very important development of thought. And so it's not a critique of the book as much as an invitation to think further. So maybe when writing the next book, you can uh, keep this in mind, I would be happy. Now to my last point, uh, migration. So I'll start with a very superficial way of engaging this because in the context of migration, in the past years, I've so often encountered the talk about law and order. And funnily enough, law and order almost seems to be opposed to, um, well, or it seems to be go quite well with a lot of um, violations of law. So one could often see that there were a lot of violations of rights of migrants, while at the same time, the same people would talk about law and order, which always made me a bit skeptic what this order is that seems to have so little in common with law. So I think there is a present, there's an idea of order. And again, I say that's a very superficial point that has to do with what you mean by order so much. But I think there's something about this top-down understanding in order, in this law and order idea that draws attention to um, its connection or its uneasy relationship with rights 
at time, with rights really as individual positions that are on the one hand in the law, but at the same time made to challenge the law. And more generally, I think in the context of migration, well, we do have, um, uh, we, we do have an ongoing dynamic that is foreseen by the law through migrants' rights, but at the same time, it concerns people that aren't present of the order as it exists. So that, this quest for a dynamic and its kind of embedding in the institutions is something that, um, that well, th that I don't find completely covered by this thinking of paradigms of order. And to end, I, to, to me, in addition to the binaries you're working with, which is holistic, individualistic, and universalism and particularism, a binary that for me has been very important is concrete and abstract. And namely for universalism to distinguish between an abstract universalism that is really an idea of encompassing the world, humanity, and a concrete universalism that works with principles, but doesn't necessarily have to have in mind that all of humanity kind of fits into an order, but keeps an order open with this universal quest. So if in your answer you want to say something on migration, I'm keen to hear it. I just want to thank you again for writing this book, thanking uh, you all for listening to my comments, and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much. Um, just one uh, one remark on your um, observations as to the post postmodern and its uh, and its place in uh, in the book. I do think that uh, many parts of the book are indeed um, a very uh, inspiring comment on current debates in post postmodernism. For example, the parts on natural laws, uh, secular natural law, and the critical engagement with these traditions. Um, and other parts that uh, that immediately contribute to the current discussions we have on the limits of uh, of liberty and uh, and emancipation, as you put it, Dana. And I think that uh, that is due to the kind of double temporality that we see in the book. That it, on the one hand side, gives a very distinct. Um, uh, reflection of and, and engagement with the debates we have seen in the last 20 years, but against this step, backdrop, of course, also long durée history of uh, of political thought on uh, order and and social order, and this, of course, uh, prompts that question or observation of a kind of geological hermeneutics that really locates um, these discussions and paradigms in the wider. Um, kind of contextual situatedness of a certain point in political history and politics, actually. Uh, Sergio, I would now invite you to, to comment briefly on the three uh, rich presentations that we have had on the panel before we open up for a few minutes for other comments and questions from the audience. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the comments and the remarks, uh, very thought-inspiring indeed. It will be difficult to me uh, in just a couple of minutes to, uh, to take into proper account all uh, very interesting remarks, but I try to give at least an a look over the most uh, relevant questions. First of all, the first question posed by Jochen, are the paradigms mirroring their time or are they going beyond that, are they uh, a kind of guidance for our action? Let's make, let's think of, of a possible, two possible examples. To see this is on one side and Machiavelli on the other. Uh, they both react to, to a situation of a decay of uh, the norms, the normative structure of their societies. So in particular, the, the loss of the normal of Tonellenos, and the decay of the Italian um, city-states. They react by saying, what can I say now? I say that the communities are acting in a realistic way. They are simply pursuing their immediate interest. But they don't stop there. They say also this is the only way how things are to be seen correctly. So this is also a guidance. It's not just a mirroring of the time, it's also a guidance. And I think that this can be applied to all paradigms. The paradigms are rooted in that time because they answer to the questions, to the challenges that uh, come out from, from that time. But then they also say, this is the right way to, to not just to see things, but also to act, act in this kind of world. 
So in the sense that this, they are the same time descriptive and prescriptive. That makes uh, so uh, sometimes difficult to, to understand this, this tension, but it is inside every aspect of these interpretations. Uh, the second one, the second question posed by, by Jochen. What could we say as regards, I mean, this, actually this pretty much a similar question to the first one posed by, by Matthias. So uh, I adopted an approach. So I took one paradigm and then followed the development of this paradigm from the beginning until more or less the present time. This is a questionable approach for sure, because why did I decide to, to, to choose this approach? Simply because it is easier not to lose, to lose the thread of the argument. That's the point, actually. And I actually I left, or I, I want to leave to the reader to try to, to understand how in the single context, the different paradigms can interact because it, was, it would have been impossible. If the book is heavy enough, it would have been much longer and much deeper. But let's make an example of how things can be understood. You often made the example of the 19th century. Um, well, 19th century, we have a predominant paradigm in my eyes. This is the so-called the oldest one, the particularistic, uh, the least in particular. And so in the sense, communities are the only form of order, single community, there is no super state he often uh, says correctly that this kind of approach, nonetheless, has some differences from the old one uh, similar approach, and he's right. I mean, if I remember correctly, I don't don't recall any kind of uh, um, kind of, of reference by ancient thinkers. I mean, ancient Greek thinkers to a kind of duty or task towards the whole humanity. The task they were so talking about was a task in favor of their police. So in the 19th century, we have a different approach. This kind of particularism is in disguise, in the sense that every single state does not just say, I'm acting so and so because I'm, I act in the interest of of the United Kingdom and acting in this of France and acting in this of late of Germany or Italy and so on, of Belgium. We are acting so because we are acting in the interest of humanity. Because there is an idea of humanity. In the old Greek thought, there is no idea of a shared humanity. It starts later, starts more or less with the Stoic philosophy. It is astonishing, but it is like that. So in this sense, in the 19th century, there is a kind of uh, pressure on, on, on those who are uh, so justifying this approach. It doesn't enough to say, it is not enough to say we are acting in the interest of our community. It must be said we are acting interesting in, in the interest of the humanity. But this interest of humanity is not referring to institutions or norms which include the whole humankind. They are uninterpreted within the context of particularistic institution and norm. So it is the United Kingdom that acts in the interest of humanity within the borders of its influence. And it is France, it is Germany, and so on. There is no institution above them, which is somehow, so, so to say, compulsory, or even at least morally compulsory. Um, so in this sense, we can say that the predominant pattern of 19th century is indeed holistic particulars, but it has different, so there is a dash of something else in that. Well, that's not indeed, in the book it was impossible to, to, to also to, 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 to talk about this aspect because simply it would have been too much, I'm afraid. The third point uh, posed by, by Jochen, well, I, I completely agree that the idea of Kelsen was extremely imposing. The point is that, is it possible? It is not just feasible. It is justifiable that states are regarded simply at the um, so place uh, holder for international law. I think it is a reduction which is not acceptable. In particular, democratic constitutional states 
they're enshrining the institutions and norms, a certain kind of civic community. And it has to be a knowledge. So there is a tension between universalism and parochialism, which cannot be only solved in the favor, surely in my case, not in favor, favor of uh, parochialism, surely not, but not on, also not in the just uh, unilateral one-sided um, favor for universal. So it has to be uh, balanced. And it is difficult. How can it be balanced? My idea, which are also quite marginally exposed in the book, is that it can could be done on the basis of some kind of very well organized and architecturally very well structured um, idea of of, uh, of communication of dialogue between between institutions and or not just courts, also institutions and so. Um, is that feasible? But in these times, it is difficult to think about. But it is, I think, the idea. I think Article 267 of, of the Treaty on the Function of the European Union is, is a very good example of how things could be done. Because it respects, at the same time, the primacy, but also dialogue. And uh, I think it is an excellent example. But anyway. Um, moving on, uh, well, I think uh, Adam Müller, well, it is interesting why I'm talking about Adam Müller. That's a specific topic, but it is interesting because I don't want to talk about Hegel as, as, a, as the godfather of, uh, of nationalism. That's the reason. And I think that Adam Müller, in this sense, is very important. Obviously, I mean, he was probably not personally very influential, but he can in a very concise form, present precisely what's happening in that time. And probably this was some kind of, uh, not completely, it was unconscious. Probably the poets were more influential than Adam Müller. But in the end, how he understood nation, how he understood the, this move, this turn from physics to biology, it is extremely significant. And don't say that Adam Müller is the influential thing. I say it perfectly exemplifies a certain idea of how things are going to, to be uh, developed in the 19th century. And it's not Hegel, poor Hegel, by the way. Really very much mistreated by, in particular by international um, Chapter uh, seven, well, too much into the idea of postmodern. Well, Probably it's true, but I mean, the point is, let's try, I, I tried in this book to do something which is very dangerous. I tried to reduce the complexity of, uh, I mean, uh, wealth of thought into some kind of very distinctive categories. And what is the particular, the particularity, the particular aspect of chapter six, seven? that order, as it was understood for many, many, many centuries and millennia, if you want, has been challenged for the first time in, in Western thinking. So order is not just a positive thing first, and order to be somehow positive must not be a whole order. It can be understood as specific order. In this sense, also IPA is an answer in this direction because it doesn't, actually it doesn't, it doesn't try to give an, an account on, whole, on the whole system of all. That is a specific idea. And it is true indeed that, for example, I know that Koskeniemi does not like very much uh, neoliberalism and, and Marie Slova in, in particular, but uh, they are in the same box, which is a little bit of probably they wouldn't be feel very comfortable in the same box, but but they are there for a specific reason because they only address one element. They say in the end we don't need a whole system. We need to, to fragment, to accept the fragmentation of the system. In one case, in case of Koskaniemi, because we cannot do anything else, and then we have to move within this fragmentation the most clever, most clever way. And in the case of uh, 
is more, uh, more assertive in the case of Anne-Marie Slaughter because this gives us some kind of freedom. And this freedom is given through fragmentation and not through a whole order, and it is new. And I think it is possible without the revolution introduced by postmodern thinking, this kind of understanding would be impossible. Um, well, last decades uh, have shown that communication is a distant link. Yeah, I mean, probably yes, but this is the advantage of when you are doing philosophy is that the point is that you can say, can simply try to say, I see a problem. The problem is very, it's a heavy problem and I propose a solution. The solution does not become, become true or surely not false, not wrong, simply because it is not realized within months. I don't want to be, uh, I mean, to, to, to compare myself with Kant, surely, but I mean, the proposal made by Kant more than 200 years ago that this is necessary. We have experienced a great number of wars after that. Did the thought of Kant be become senseless because of the many wars? No, it's a, it is a normative issue. You have a problem, you give, try to give a solution, and then you have to try to realize it. Simply that. Um, you're right. I mean, Genesis is uh, indeed. It is uh, somehow. I didn't think about that. You're perfectly right, Dana. It's. Um, it's correct. Uh, do I think that 20 years or 30 years or 40 years of parallel will be the same? Or honestly, I don't know. I mean that it depends on, on, the, on the challenges that uh, we will have or someone else, but anyway, uh, we'll have. Um, and uh, as a result, uh, the answer that will be found, uh, generally I would say a well-established paradigm, as I said also in the introduction, tend not to die out not to become extinct. We don't know, honestly, as regards the last developed paradigms, whether they are well established or not. I think they are too new to say that. But I, I suppose, I really suppose that in a couple of de decades, we will still have the idea that order can only be realizing homogeneous and limited communities or that we need a order for the whole humankind based on natural reason. Honestly, I, I think that they will still be there this paradigm, in which form? It depends on how the challenges will be. Um, order is for some purpose, but not necessarily. In chapter on postmodernism, uh, I try to, to show that order, it is an important, uh, so challenge, an important element introduced, introduced by, 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 by postmodern is that order is not, it's not the God's law. I mean, it can also be very, very problematic. Order can be actually oppressive. And in this sense, uh, yes, order, if it is justifiable, is for some purpose, but it also needs to be, also needs to be criticized. So, in this sense, order must be, may be, but not necessary. We have indeed, meanwhile, understandings of paradigms of society, which simply means that disorder is better than order. Or that we need a completely different order, an order not male based, not uh, uh, Western based, so completely different idea. Um, then we're taking other traditions into account. We are Right. I mean, I, I said in the, at the beginning, also in the first chapter of the book, that's simply lack of confidence. <laughs> There's no other better reason than that. Thank um, you. Migration, maybe just last word about migration. I think it is indeed a, a, a very, a very important challenge. And uh, I would answer in a similar way as answer to, to the question posed by, by uh, Jochen, namely, Migration also can be put into the context of the tension between universal rights and identity of the political community. I tried to develop this in, in an article a couple of years ago. 
It is difficult, but I think it is possible. What we are now experiencing, the debate about migration, is that we have two opposing um, understandings, the citizens of the world and the citizens of the polis, and they don't talk to one another. And the point is that these two approaches, which are very radical in general, and they don't, the course proposes actually, um, that should, we should try to find a, a way in between. I think it is from the practical point of view and also from the theoretical point of view, quite advisable. Thank you. Thank you. I would now give uh, room for some questions from the floor. Uh, and I would like, like to connect, collect a few questions and statements before we give uh, Sergio the, the opportunity for a short concluding remark. So I see Mortima Sellers. Mortima. Thank you. Um, well, first, um, thank you, Sergio, for such a uh, gentle, perceptive, learned, and humane approach to the study of law. It uh, comforts me and uh, makes me feel warmer and happier with the world uh, to hear this conversation. Uh, I also enjoyed the learned and reflective comments uh, so well expressed uh, on your book. Uh, I want to reinforce one of the observations that I heard from uh, Dana Schmaltz. She asked about the normativity of your uh, meta-narrative, whether at the end of your labors you rested uh, on the seventh day or the seventh year and uh, saw that it was good. Uh, and I want to repeat uh, what I think was her question, uh, which is, do you embrace this, this normativity? Do you embrace this normativity? I think, I think you do. Uh, I think, in fact, you must. But uh, nevertheless, I ask you, and, and I suppose the second question is, is it good? Thank you. Um, I see also Achilles Kodas in, this, in the chat. Achilles. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Alexandra. Uh, well, it is uh, uh, for me uh, somehow uh, crossing of borders uh, to make a few comments uh, because I didn't have the opportunity to read the book uh, yet. I promise to do it as soon as possible because the whole discussion has been uh, very, very creative and uh, inspiring for reading the book and knowing Sergio for many, many years. I'm uh, sure that it will be really, it's, it's a fundamental book that we need further to consider in our work. Uh, now, let me make a few points because they were brought uh, either from, uh, from the commentators or from, uh, from Sergio. And uh, I would like to, to make a few points. The first of all, it's uh, I begin from migration. Well, uh, violation of rights. Uh, we usually bring into connection violation of rights with order or with uh, this similar concept. Uh, we assume violation of rights, uh, but uh, we know that human rights discourse today is uh, not only about violation of existing rights, but uh, politics of rights policies of rights. So uh, I, I, I claim that uh, violations of rights are less than we believe, because uh, if we take a look at the jurisprudence of international courts, we continually see uh, unwillingness to, to find a violation of rights of migrants. It's not a violation of rights to block somebody to enter your territory in principle. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a case by case decision. And uh, until we have a judgment that says that it happened, well, I assume as a lawyer that it hasn't. Uh, secondly, we see some impressive developments also in, uh, in uh, the International Court of Justice. We know that the word racism is overused in our time for uh, extremely serious points uh, to, to very banal points. And uh, the International Court of, uh, of Justice, uh, in a recent judgment, Qatar versus the Emirates, has put an end to that 
by uh, giving a very restrictive interpretation of racial discrimination, focusing only uh, on, uh, on uh, instances and cases that are narrow in the sense of not affecting non-citizens. So racial discrimination uh, is not applicable in distinctions uh, because of, uh, of citizenship. And uh, this gives uh, really uh, an idea how the political discourse is different from, from the real one. And finally, uh, I mean, uh, Krasner has spoken about uh, uh, sovereignty as organized hypocrisy. Uh, there are some blind spots in our discussions that we need to look. And uh, I, would have, I have the impression that recently, uh, the, the Western academia engages in a new civilizing mission uh, to lecture the world uh, about uh, the right and the wrong. So it's, uh, I feel that uh, it's part of our, uh, of our uh, cultural understanding uh, to lecture others. So let's see if we, if we speak about universalism, let's see how thick or how uh, thin universalism is and generally accepted principles. Thank you, Thank Sergio, you. for giving us the opportunity of this discussion. Thank you. And as the last on the list, I have Matthias Hartwig, and I would ask you to to be please brief in your comments. Yes, yeah, thank you very much. I can uh, just link up uh, to what uh, Achilles said. First of all, of course, thank you very much for the book. Uh, it is really appealing. I haven't read. I haven't read it. Uh, so uh, I, there's some uh, big task before me. Um, nevertheless, allow me to make uh, some comments after all what has been discussed here. It seems uh, that there was a, a description, an interpretation of a sequence of paradigms in time. Um, you could have also compared uh, paradigms in different cultural territorial areas. And my question is, is it possible to develop to develop a meta theory of paradigms and the development of paradigms, universal theory, without taking into consideration different cultures with different paradigms? Is it possible to derive from our European experience a general a universal theory? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sergio, we have two minutes for a short concluding remark. Two minutes is really, really short time. I will be very, very fast. Is the, do I embrace some kind of normativity in my approach? Yes, I do. But the point is that I started when I was a young guy by studying Hegel and uh, well, that's remained somehow. So look at the end of the book, simply that. So, I mean, uh, that's always the end is always what the author tends to, to embrace normative. So indeed, there is, there is a normative approach for sure, but I try honestly to present what I, even what I do not like that much as an understanding of social order in a, in, in a fair uh, view, because the, the book is not just for scholars, but it also intended to be possibly for students and they should not be too much influenced about what I think about what is good and what is wrong. Um, Achilles, thank you very much. I mean, you, you just uh, actually point out that also difficulties, but also the change that can be um, seen in applying the paradigms to concrete problems. We saw the problems of migration, we can see some other problems, it would be a completely different conversation. I mean, an inter a very interesting one, by the way. I think it is possible indeed, and the book was taught. I didn't escape the problems, the practical, but I, could, I kept them in mind actually, but it was not uh, possible to go into details too much in this context. I tried to do it a little bit in the last chapter indeed, uh, so trying to, to develop some, some answers, answers to some problems, but I think in the end, this is a map. It's not an analysis of a specific 
uh, hill or, or, or river or, or pond, I don't know. It is a map for some kind of orientation. And then from the map, you can then say this pond is nice, this pond is cold or too warm. I don't the third, uh, Matthias, thank you very much indeed. Is it possible to analyze paradigms without taking into account the different cultures? Well, I mean, it is evidently possible because I did it, but uh, the question is, um, does it make sense? Well, it makes a limited sense. I, I must acknowledge it. I mean that, uh, but I said at the beginning, this is a, uh, indeed, this is a limit of this attempt, but it is not, uh, um, doesn't mean that, uh, I think this is an analysis of paradigms of social order within the Western cultural tradition. This is incomplete, but the fact that other tradition should be added doesn't make the analysis, I think, senseless. Just need to be completed, not by me, probably. Thank you very, very much uh, for, for giving me the possibility, not just to, to discuss my book, but also to be with you, which was a, a real great pleasure. Thank you. Again. Thank you so much. And thanks also to the panelists and to everyone engaging in this discussion, but of course, particularly to Sergio for having brought this book to the table. And I think this has really been an exercise in thinking where we could see and experience how uh, how the author developed his thought and to what extent this book is also a contribution to an ongoing debate and for all of you who haven't read it yet you will certainly have noticed that this is definitely a book to be taken into the holiday season and into the transition to the new year because it opens so many imaginations and further readings and and thoughts so I think this was this was an ex excellent uh, volume to conclude also this year of the ample momentum here at the Berlin office of the Institute. And I thank you all very much and wish you a peaceful and joyful holiday season and look forward to see many of you back in the coming year, hopefully soon again in person as well. Thank you. <laughs>